What's up, traders and investors? Welcome back. It's TradersArmy.com's Options Foundation Series. Today we're going to focus on buying stock versus buying call options. This is also known as long stock, taking long stock positions or taking long call options positions. And we're going to start to build in some rules and some criteria that we need to be able to uh, uh, really control uh, in order to set up the right position when buying simple call options. So uh, if you have any questions about this or any other web series, feel free to hit us up, support at tradersarmy.com, and we'll get right back to you with any questions you may have about this or any other web series here at tradersarmy.com. As a reminder, an option offers the buyer the right but not the obligation to either buy or sell the underlying at a specific price, that's our strike price, on or before a specific date. That's our expiration date. Buyers will always pay the premium to the seller, which means in this particular case, where we're going to be getting into buying options, we're going to have to have, to have the premium in our accounts. Whatever that option cost us, we're going to buy that option using premium, using that, using that money today and paying that premium to the seller. We will reserve the right to exercise that option, but we are not going to exercise our rights. We are options traders, not options exercisers. We're simply going to look to capture the move of the underlying stock without actually having to own the underlying stock. And we're going to use the option as our tool to do that. So when we buy to open a option position, we will then turn around in the future at some point and sell to close this option way before expiration dates. And we're going to be focusing again on buying call options today. So buying call options means that we pay a premium. Our outlook is bullish. We have the right to buy the underlying at a set price. Therefore, if the underlying goes up in price in the future, our right to buy at a specific lower price becomes more valuable. And the rate at which that option increases in value uh, is referred to looking at our option delta to help determine how much of that move we're going to capture each and every dollar that market goes up. If you did not sit through our uh, options Greeks web series, I highly recommend going back and doing that. It's going to have some key, uh, key terminology, key characteristics, and key principles to learning how to really build this position uh, to minimize risk due to time, volatility, and directional movement of the underlying. So first and foremost, we are going to get into a checklist for trading options. This checklist will exist for all options trades at its very foundational level. It's important that you do not skip a step and you must go through the steps in this order, in this order, okay? So first and foremost, we have to have a understanding of where the entire broad market is expected to go because when the market goes up as you guys have probably seen not every stock but a majority of the stocks will be going up with the whole broad market if the whole broad market is going down then a majority maybe not all but a majority will also be going down stocks make up the broad market and they tend to all kind of run in tandem when you look at the S&P 500 or the Dow Jones Industrials or the Russell 2000 or even the NASDAQ, uh, typically those markets, A, they have a lot of the same stocks uh, except for the Russell 2000, but the Dow, the S&P, and the NASDAQ are all going to have the same stocks within its index. Um, in some cases, the exact same stocks. In other cases, some have more, some have less. But anyway, this indicates our broad market. So the last thing we want to do is think that a stock is going to go up and ignore the broad market because what happens if the broad market goes down and you need your stock to go up? The probability of your stock going up when the whole broad market is going down, not probable at all. So we want to align our long stock positions with a broad market that's coming off of a support level and is also expected to rise. This way the broad market rises, most stocks will rise, it makes our trade that much more highly probable is going to work out in our favor. And if you're trading um, stocks specifically, not an entire index or not an index ETF or a sector ETF, we do need to take a look at the sector that that stock is in. Okay, we'll look at the sector that that stock is in before ever choosing a, uh, a stock within that sector to make sure that the whole sector is expected to do what we need our stock to do. Once we've dove down into the sectors, we'll dive down into stock screening and selection. 
part of the sector analysis is to make sure that when we're buying stocks, we're buying stocks in strong sectors. When we're looking to short stocks, meaning you need the market to go down, uh, or using an option position, needing the market to go down, we want to short stocks in weaker sectors. So um, we are on the options foundation portent, uh, uh, section of our of our educational content, but if you have any questions on how to actually go through the steps of the broad market analysis, the sector analysis, the stock screening and selection, how to check news, earnings, FDA announcements, stock splits, things like that, um, how to set up the entry, the stop loss, the targets, identify risk reward criteria on an underlying as if you were going to trade the stock outright, then you would need to, if you haven't already done so, go back and watch our charting foundations and just our overall trading foundations when it comes to focusing on stocks and stocks alone. I am going to start off this conversation today assuming that you personally have a strategy at the way that you pick your stocks. Uh, if you don't have a strategy, maybe you're using our strategy here at TradersArmy.com, our methodology, our rules, and you would have uh, you would have probably picked those up from some of the earlier web series, just focusing on trading foundations, not specifically options as we are now. But we're going to apply all of that technique and all that strategy. We're going to apply those rules to our options trading as well. So all of this, these first five bullet points, really refer to the stock itself. Okay, we're not going to jump right in and start trading options on a stock if we haven't already done our analysis on the stock first, as if we were going to trade the stock outright. And we could trade the stock outright if you wanted to. If you wanted to go long or short the stock outright, you're more than welcome to. But again, when we're going through this web series, understand that we're using options as a way to leverage a smaller amount of capital, get a bigger rate of return and minimize our risk. And options can do that and uh, stocks necessarily can't always do that. So we're going to focus on options, but these first five, this is all building an outlook on the underlying stock position first. Then we start to look at the options and say, okay, I like the stock. The stock has enough risk, I mean, enough reward to justify the risk. There's no big news coming out. There's no earnings around the corner. There's no big FDA announcements, no big surprise, you know, things that are coming out. Um, that could uh, hurt our position. So now that we know we are interested in trading this stock, let's look at the options and make sure there's enough liquidity. Again, making sure there's at least 200 contracts open on the options. And you can, I'll show you how we find that again here in just a second. Making sure that the bid and the ask spreads, the bid ask spreads are narrow enough. Remember, we're looking for spreads that are 10% uh, or less uh, than the premium value itself. 10% of the premium value itself or less, and then ideally less than 30 cents uh, between the bid and the ask when looking at the options trades. We then need to look at the implied volatility of those options on that stock. Understand that it makes no sense to do any volatility analysis if there's no liquidity on the options. Who cares what the volatility is if the liquidity on the options stinks? In fact, who cares that the liquidity in the options stink if we don't want to trade the stock anyway? That's why I suggest going through these steps in this order. Do not move them around and do not skip any. But if we've made it this far to where we, we want to trade the stock, meaning it has enough reward to justify the risk and everything looks good on the stock, and there's liquidity in the options, we must check volatility to see if volatility is high, low, or somewhere in the middle because that's going to determine the trade that we make. Okay, In this particular trade, we are going to build a long call position. And I'll remind you, we need to make sure that volatility is in the lower 20% of its one-year range. We'll use volatility charts for that. And again, we've already gone through that in a previous web series, but we'll do that again in here as a reminder. Choose the option strategy for your outlook on the underlying and the current volatility environment. Analyze risk reward on the chosen option position. We'll all do this together. Position size appropriately for your personal account. And then enter the trade with all the stops, alerts, and targets so you can walk away and let the trade play out. Coming back periodically to identify is it appropriate to alter the stop loss, meaning lock in some profits. When the trade is closed out, we're not just going to forget about it. We're going to journal the trade. 
We have a whole web series on the trade plan and trade journals. In fact, we have a whole class that we've built around building a trade plan and journaling that is uh, ideal for everyone who is looking to trade. It's important that you have a trade plan and a journal to make sure that you can really go back in time over the last 10, 15, 20 trades and see how the trades played out after you got out of the trade. This will help us minimize mistakes in the future. So again, volatility is key. So we've gone through this already in a previous web series, but just as a reminder, middle 60%, if we look back at the options volatility and we see that volatility is in the middle 60%, we will be using spread trades. We haven't covered spread trades yet. We'll get to those in the advanced sections of our web series on options. If implied volatility is in the upper 20% of its range, we are going to sell short options and sell those high, high priced expensive options. And if volatility is low, we are going to be buying options and going long and creating some different types of calendar spreads, which again, we haven't gone over those yet either. So what are some of the advantages of looking at long and short stock positions versus long option positions versus short option positions? Let's talk about long and short stock first. Advantages. Advantages to owning the stock outright or being short the stock. You've got unlimited profit potential. Dollar for dollar correlation. That's a great thing. We don't actually get that in options. We don't get the dollar for dollar correlation. We get unlimited profit potential in options, in buying options, but we don't get the dollar for dollar correlation. Okay, That correlation in options is relative to its options delta. Okay, No time or volatility exposure on stocks. So a uh, disadvantage to the options would be we have high volatility exposure and high theta exposure. That's our time decay. You can hold on to a stock position as long as you want indefinitely. It's not expiring. I mean, I guess it could go out of business, but the stock itself doesn't, doesn't decay in value just because time is going by. It goes down in value because the stock is going down in value. An option will go down in value even if the stock price isn't moving just due to time going by. That's a negative for the options. That's a positive for the stock. And if the stock is paying dividends, you get that. If you're short the stock, you have to pay the dividends. That's a whole other subject we'll get to in a different web series on shorting stock. Some disadvantages to owning stock, huge capital requirements in a lot of cases, especially the stocks that everybody knows and loves. You want to buy an Apple, you want to buy an Amazon, you want to buy a Tesla, you want to buy um, a Facebook, you know, etc. Those are going to be expensive stocks and we got to have a pretty large capital uh, requirement when purchasing or shorting those stocks. Going long inside your retirement accounts, you can do that. You can buy inside a retirement account, but you can't short inside of a retirement account simply because you have to borrow the stock outright to short it. And you can't borrow in your retirement accounts, therefore no shorting allowed in an IRA. And you've got a pretty significant, you could call it in some cases, unlimited risk when uh, buying and selling stock outright. Now, some advantages to options, just long option positions. We get the unlimited profit potential, just like stock, but we have limited, oftentimes defined risk, which is the premium that we pay for the option. That's the most we could lose. We have high delta exposure, which means even though we don't get dollar for dollar correlation, we still get really high correlation through the dynamic leverage built into the delta of our option position. Disadvantages, again, time goes by, we lose money on an option. If we're wrong on volatility, we have high vega exposure. If we're right on volatility and we buy only when volatility is in the lower 20% of its range and volatility rises out of that area, well then we're going to make money on that high vega exposure. Unlike if we were to buy options and they were priced high, we would lose money quickly due to that high vega exposure. So that's not always a disadvantage. That could be an advantage, and we're trying to put that in our favor by buying only when volatility is in the lower 20% of its range. You must be right on direction within a certain window of time. That's a downside to long options positions because if you are right on direction eventually, but your option has already expired, well, too bad, so sad. Your option expired some time ago and you no longer have the option. Therefore, 
you were not right on direction within a certain amount of time. Whereas, like I said, the stock position, you could hold on to that forever and maybe be right eventually. Now, short options positions, we're going to cover some more short options positions in a different web series. But with short options positions, we can benefit from passive profit. We make money due to that time decay. And again, we're not going to focus on short options positions now. We're going to focus more on that stuff a little bit later. High probability of profit, high vega exposure, which is great when we're selling options in high volatility environments. Downside is, is we have a defined profit potential. That could be a downside or it could be an advantage. I mean, a lot of times we like to know with a high degree of probability, how much money do I stand to make? And I have a very high degree of probability of making it. It is defined, so we can only make a certain amount of money when we're short options. We don't have infinite profit potential. We have greater risk potential when shorting options. But again, we're going to manage that risk through the use of stop losses. Now, as an example, here's our friend Apple. Apple was currently trading on this day at $142.41. It had dropped into a high quality support level where we saw a lot of buying pressure before. We saw a fair price for the stock. Stock went sideways for about a week and then it shot straight up. So uh, clearly we had a fair value range in this area, but then buyers came in and says, we want to buy as much as we possibly can. And there wasn't enough for sale, which puts prices higher. Now, prices have fallen back to that area. Here was another fair value area just above. Again, this is all related back to the stock itself. Okay, We're not going through too much stock analysis that we do in our trading stock web series. So we built an outlook on the stock, which is stock return to this area of support on June 16th. We're expecting with a high degree of probability that that stock will stop going down somewhere in this area turn and go higher and we'll have a price target of around 153.41. So our entry price would be buy the stock at 142.41 placing a stop loss just below 140.33 which is the low area of this fair value range. Okay. Uh, so our stop loss will be around $140.25. Our target price is $153.41. So we're basically just going to buy this support level and sell when it gets up to the selling pressure, this resistance up here. And that's going to offer us about a 5 to 1 reward to risk ratio, which is really great. Okay, really, really great there. Now, what's our risk in the trade? Okay, our risk is the difference between $142.41. So if we take $142.41 and we subtract our stop loss, 140.25, we have $2.16 worth of risk per share. So if we were to buy, say, 200 shares, it would cost us $432 if Apple dropped below $40.25. If Apple dropped below that price and we were stopped out, it would cost us about $432 total if we bought 200 shares. If you can't afford to lose $432, you can only afford to lose, say, $200, well, then you're going to buy closer to 100 shares, probably a little bit less even. But this investment of this 200 share position here is going to cost us $28,482. That's how much money will come out of our account if we want to go long the stock. Now, if you're using a margin account, margin allows us to actually buy um, using only half of our money in this position. So you'd really only have to come up with uh, half of $28,000, which is around $14,000, 14 and 14 some change. So if you were doing this in a margin account where you could hold two to one leverage overnight, you only have to have 14 grand, okay? But if we're using the entire, our entire account here, or we're doing this in a retirement account, you gotta have all $28,482 to do it. Now, what if? the stock reaches our target a little over a month later. So on 616, it came into our support level. By 725, after rallying away a little bit, notice how we rallied away here. So we had some buying pressure. We came right back to, to, uh, to test that area again. And then we finally made it up, 725. And we hit our price target and made $2,200 in 27 calendar days. Now. Keeping in mind 
that we sold that position for thirty thousand six hundred and eighty two dollars so if we bought it for twenty eight thousand four hundred eighty two sold it for thirty thousand six hundred eighty two that's where the twenty two hundred dollar net profit comes in less your little commission to make the trade so that's a 7.7 percent return on investment which is a good trade for 27 calendar days understand that we could have lost 432 dollars that was the alternative but we had our risk reward ratio working for us in our favor so let's take a look at a long call position remember a long call position is one that we expect the price to go up but we are going to have a break even price that's different from the stock position what's our break even price on the stock well our break even price on the stock is 142.41 we bought the stock for this price that's our break even on that price what if apple a month later was still at 142.41 we still own the stock we haven't lost any money we've just lost that time okay but we haven't lost any value due to time here when we buy an option we have to consider that our break-even price is the strike price that we choose plus whatever premium that we pay for that option so if we get in a stock position and the stock doesn't go anywhere doesn't go up doesn't go down just stays where it's at then we're going to lose money just due to the time decay. But any time the price of the stock has, has, has moved beyond our break-even price, we are now in the profit zone. And to, to really put the probability in our favor, here are some very specific guidelines that we have come up with to put odds in our favor of uh, really minimizing our risk due to direction, time, and volatility. Number one. And these are the rules, right? So these are the rules. These are the guidelines. So rules are, number one, we got to be have a bullish outlook on the underlying. So which means we expect profit from a rise in the price of the stock that we're trading options on. Now, the option itself, will, when we buy it, we will have the right to buy the underlying. We do not plan to exercise our rights. That's why I've crossed this out. You could exercise your rights, but we plan to close the long call position in the future. We're going to have a small cash outlay. We're only going to have to come up with the money that the option market tells us. Here's how much the options are trading for. So significantly less than what the stock is trading for. And I'll get to that. I'll show you an example on Apple in a second. We will get leveraged profits with limited downside risk. Our maximum loss or risk is equal to the premium paid. Our reward potential is unlimited, even though we're going to limit that potential by exiting our option position when the stock hits our target. I'll show you that. Time passing by, remember, will negatively impact our option position. Implied volatility rising will positively impact our position, which is why implied volatility needs to be extremely low for us to want to buy a call option. If volatility were not in the lower 20%, we would not be buying a call option outright. We'd be using a different option strategy on this stock altogether. But right now, we're using a low volatility uh, option trade on Apple. And again, our break-even price is the long call strike price we choose plus the premium paid. So guidelines for buying calls. First, Remember, check news, earnings, FDA announcements, stock splits, etc. Uh, anything that could interfere with the trade. Knowable uh, coming up in the future. Define your entry stop and targets based on the underlying. So we've already done that for Apple. We already know where our stop and entry and target is on Apple. But instead of buying Apple, we're going to buy an option. Now, we're not going to day trade this. If we're day trading, we could buy an option that has less time but we're expecting to be in this stock for several weeks, right? A move from 140 to 152 on Apple, $140 a share to $152 a share. That can actually, uh, can actually take a little while. It's typically going to take more than a day or two. It typically takes a, a week or two maybe. So we're going to buy 90 days or more worth of time when we look at purchasing options. Buy anywhere between a 40 to 60 delta. I would not buy less than 40 delta. I would not buy greater than 60 delta based on how the delta curve, as we explained in the Greeks, really impacts our position going forward. Implied volatility is extremely low, and we're going to exit the position if one of these factors happens to come to play. Number one, if our stop loss is hit, exit the trade. If our targets are met, exit the trade. If 
we purchased an option that had 90 days until expiration and we are now 45 days from expiration okay meaning we've been in this trade for you know 45 days um, then we're gonna get out why is that well if you guys remember from our Greeks conversation theta time decay is the quickest it affects the options the quickest in the last 30 to 40 days of an options life. So since we are long this option and we are losing money due to time decay, we want to make sure that we exit the position if we get too close to expiration. Or if we have some impending news coming up, like if you know that Apple's earnings are coming up on a certain date, which you would know that already because you would have checked that, and you have not achieved your target price yet, and you haven't been stopped out and we're not within 45 days of expiration but we got news coming up next you know in the next couple of days we're gonna wanna exit that position to get out of the way of the news so remember with the stock trading somewhere around hundred and forty two dollars a share at the time that we were looking to enter the stock position we're gonna purchase an option that carries between a 40 to 60 delta I will tell you oftentimes I will typically buy somewhere around a 40 to 50 delta but you could buy something as deep as, as as far in the money as a 60 delta position so right now we're gonna buy this option which is really close to 142 really close to 142 so 140 is the strike price we're buying now all options chains as you have already uh, seen uh, are going to have call options on the left and put options on your right. This is not all, but I mean, typically you're going to find calls on the left, puts on the right. So we're going to focus on the left-hand side of the grid here. I've expanded the options that have 126 days until they expire. Remember, we're looking at at least 90 days or more. And in this case, we've chosen to go to the 126 days and purchase the $140 call option. There is 22,000 contracts uh, already open so therefore we have clearly surpassed the 200 contract minimum that we're looking for and we have a 57 Delta on this option now the spread is only 10 cents wide between the bid price and the ask price now when we place this order in real life we're really gonna be trying to cut that down and we're gonna say I will buy this call option but I will offer you $8.65. I'm not going to pay you $8.70. I'll offer you $8.65 and see if you'll take that. And once that order is submitted as a limit order, somebody out there has the option to sell you their option for $8.65. And oftentimes, we will get our order filled by splitting the spread in half and putting in an order to get in at the mid price. Okay, that's what the mid price is referring to. So halfway between the bid and the ask, it's your mid. But right now we're gonna keep it simple. We're gonna go long the 140 strike calls for $8.70 per share because it meets our rules and guidelines. The underlying stock met our rules and guidelines and so does this option itself. Okay, what if the option had 80 contracts open interest? We wouldn't trade it. What if the spread were a dollar wide between the bid and the ask? We wouldn't trade it because it was greater than 30 cents. You, you, you get the point? So we've got a liquid underlying. This thing traded 31 million shares that day. 31 million shares that one day. That's Apple for you. Some of the biggest volume out there on a stock. And therefore, the options are going to reflect that immense liquidity. So we're going to buy four contracts with this. And I'll show you in our analyzer how we come to this conclusion where one contract risk equals 98 bucks. One contract worth of risk was giving us 98 bucks. I'll show you that in a second, but it's all related back to our option delta. Remember, we're risking around $2.16 in this trade. Where do we come up with that? Well, remember, the stock itself had entry, stop, target already mapped out so when we enter at 142.41 our option position and we have a stop loss at $140.25 we're going to be risking two dollars and some change on the stock but we're not trading the stock we're going to risk that on our option position so when we have a delta of 57 
we're really only risking 57% of that $2 and change move. And I'll show you in the options analyzer when we build a trade out live in just a moment, I'll show you how we get to that conclusion nice and simple. But this delta tells us we're risking 57 cents every dollar or 57% of a dollar. So 57% of $2 is about 98 bucks, right? A little bit more, a little bit less, somewhere around that 100 bucks, okay? Now, so if we are able to risk $400, we can buy four contracts, which is about the same risk that we're taking as 200 shares owning the stock. Now, the big difference is what's our total investment? Well, our total investment on the stock was $28,000 to buy four contracts at $8.70 a share, one contract would cost $870 because everything's times 100 shares. We multiply $870 times four contracts and we have an out-of-pocket total investment of $3,480. So let's consider this. What's our most out-of-pocket risk? Our out-of-pocket most, most money we could lose even if Apple goes to zero is $3,480. Now, we're not going to risk all of that because we're going to have a stop loss in below 140 on the stock, below $140.25. We're not going to risk all that. But even if Apple never op if Apple goes bankrupt overnight, which is not going to happen, but if it did, what would you lose if you bought 200 shares of the stock? You'd lose $28,000. But if we own the option, not the stock, and Apple goes bankrupt, only thing we could lose is our option, which is three thousand four hundred eighty bucks. So with the stock trading at one forty two forty one, and we have a bullish outlook, outlook, we bought a four month option with a hundred and forty strike call at eight hundred dollars, eight hundred and seventy dollars per contract. That's eight dollars and seventy cents per share. Our delta on that's around fifty eight, so we are fifty eight percent sensitive to whatever the underlying does. Our max reward is unlimited. However, we are going to have a profit target at 153.41. Therefore, we are going to limit our profit in this trade to the difference between the entry price and the target price on the stock. Our exit would be if we get stopped out of the trade below 140 and a quarter, roughly. So let's see what happens. When the stock went to 153.41, as we saw it in the previous slide where the stock actually went up to our price target 27 days later, notice what happened to our $140 call option. What we bought for $8.70 over a month ago is now worth $15.45 a share. That's how much we could sell it for. What we bought for $3,480 total cost for contracts could now be sold for $6,180. How do we get to that number? $15.45 per share is $1,545 per contract times our four contracts. $15.45 times four is $6,180. So if we bought an option for $34.80, sold it for $61.80, we have a $2,700 profit on the option with a 77% return on our original investment. Notice what happened to our option delta. We started out with a 58 delta when the stock and the option were really close in price. When the stock was at 142, up here in the far left-hand corner, and the option we chose was 140, our at-the-money option had around a 57 delta. It'll always have around a 50 delta, and it does. When the stock goes up and that option becomes deeper in the money, our option gets larger, that's gamma, causing our delta to become more dynamic and actually make money faster. Okay, So that's what caused that dynamic leverage allowed us to actually make more money in the option position than we made in the stock position. Check this out side by side. If we were long the stock, we paid $28,482 sorry, $28, for the total investment, which means our maximum out-of-pocket risk was everything. On the call options, our investment was a fraction of the cost. And our risk was a fraction of the max risk in buying the calls. Our stop loss risk in both cases was about 400 bucks. So we have about equal risk. Our realized profit on the stock was $2,200. 
our realized profit on the option was $2,700. So we made more money in the option, which is very typical, especially because the minimized risk per contract allows us to trade bigger position sizes in options versus smaller position sizes in stocks. So it's not uncommon to make more money in options than it is in stocks. The rate of return, your percentage return on investment, is calculated by dividing the profit into the investment. Profit into investment. So if you made a $2,200 profit on a $28,000 investment, that was your 7.7% .7 return on investment. When you do the math on the long calls, the profit into your investment, that's a 77% return on your trade, which is far superior than the long stock position. And in most cases, you can go long the stock outright. So why not all cases can you go long the stock? Well, there's where once you get into things like 401ks, a 403b, a 457, a TSP, something that's company-driven, state-run, government, you know, military pension, something like that, you can't always just go out and buy whatever stock you want. But in all of your in typical investment accounts, IRAs, Roth IRAs, SEP IRAs, your uh, investment trading accounts, joint accounts, etc., you can actually purchase this stock no problem. Same with calls. You can buy call options in all of your accounts uh, that you open up, your IRAs, your Roth IRAs, your SEP IRAs, your trading and investment accounts. Uh, where you will run into issues with buying you know, stocks and options is if you have an investment manager, somebody who's managing your equity positions for you, they may say, no, nah, we're not going to buy stocks. We're just going to focus on mutual funds, index funds, things like that. Uh, they may not allow you to buy stocks in those accounts. But if you're completely self-directing, the broker that you choose will allow you to buy stock and options in your accounts, period. Now, the rules, remember the rules, it's important. Do not skip a step. You must go through these steps in this order. Broad market analysis, sector analysis, stock screening selection, so forth. Okay, so before we wrap our session here, I want to build an example out with you guys to show you the process on this, which is GLD, so gold. Okay, so I've done some analysis on gold ETF already. The gold ETF, this is a daily chart on gold has been dropping, dropping, dropping for about the last week, almost week and a half. Now, we have been back at this area of support. Notice how we had a pretty fair value range in here where prices just kind of went sideways. And then we gapped out of there, gapped again out of there higher, and then we pulled back a little bit, and then we took off to around 128 bucks. And then price stopped, made a pivot in price, turned, and started to come back down found some fair value here again, and then gapped away and dropped down. So we have two fair value ranges here, really high quality fair value ranges between 120 and 125.46. So if GLD comes down to this price point, we want to buy it. Okay. If GLD keeps going below 118.99, we're going to sell it. If GLD hits 120.04 and we buy it and prices go up to 125.46, we're going to sell the stock and we're going to make a profit that looks to be roughly 5 to 1 reward to risk, a little better than 5 to 1 reward to risk. But our entry price would be based upon our um, upper line in our fair value zone, our top line in our fair, val our fair, fair value zone. Our stop loss would go below the lower line in our fair value zone, suggesting that if prices fall below fair value, we no longer want to be an owner at 120.04, so we're going to be out. If prices make it back up to 125.46, we sell the stock, we make our monies. Okay. Now, let's go to the option trade. So for us to be looking at buying a call, where does, now I know you can't answer because this is pre-recorded, but where does the implied volatility need to be for us to buy this option? It needs to be low. Okay, It needs to be in the lower 20% of its range. Okay, So let's make that assumption right now um, that, that gold is in the lower 20% of its range. Now, we don't want to always make assumptions. We always just want to go out and do the analysis. So I'm going to add the study here, 
and I'm going to go to my edit studies and strategies and I'm going to add implied volatility as a study. Okay, we'll search for it, go down implied volatility, double click, it adds it in, apply it, okay. Now here's our volatility graph. Now again, this is an example trade, so we are looking back at how low volatility has been in the past, and it's been pretty low. Grab my tool here, and how high it's been in the past, and it's been pretty high. Okay, and if we go ahead and edit properties of this Fibonacci tool, highlight the 20%, highlight the 80%, click OK, it actually tells us we are not in the lower 20% of our range. We are not in the lower 20% of our range. In fact, we were a week ago and we popped right out of there as we typically do because when we get down into our lower 20% of our range, we don't stay there for very long. So in real life, if we were to look at making this trade right now, we couldn't simply go out and buy calls. We would have to use a spread trade, but we haven't gotten to spread trades yet. So that's what I'm saying. Let's make the assumption that we've done the implied volatility analysis. We are in the lower end of its range and buying calls is the right trade. Buying calls is the right trade because we expect the stock to go up and volatility is low. If we expected the stock to go down, we would buy put options because volatility is low. But right now, let's build a trade based on this fact that volatility being low, buying calls, stock is in a support level, means we think the stock is going up, or that's what our outlook states. Now, in this Thinkorswim platform, you don't have to use this trading platform, we're just using my own platform here. I'm going to go over to the Analyze tab. So Analyze a Simulated Trade. I just clicked on Analyze, went down to the Add Simulated Trade. And again, one of the rules is when buying options, a rule is buy with at least 90 days or more worth of time. Buy 90 days more worth of time. So all of these parentheses here tell us how many days are left until the option expires. So we really can't buy anything or shouldn't buy anything that expires in less time than March. Okay. If you wanted to go out a little bit further and buy 114 days, 136, 100, you're welcome to buy a little bit further out in time. You'll see there's an enormous amount of time in some of these options. Um, but pretty typically speaking, I'd go out and I'd buy between 100 days, 90 days, and about 100 and 30, 140 days. In this case, because we need gold to go from here to here, the last time it made a move of that magnitude was here. It took 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 days to make a move of that magnitude. And we can see that gold is not really moving very quickly at this point. Uh, to the upside, so it may take some time. Therefore, I'm going to go out personally and purchase the 136-day option uh, just to give it just a little bit more time. Now, what's the benefit here of buying a little bit more time? Well, your theta exposure will be a little bit lower than buying something that expires a little bit sooner. Um, as a reminder, Theta, here's your time decay, theta curve. Example, five months worth of time. If we buy an option that has five, three to four, four months worth of time, and we hold it for a month from month four down to month three as we get closer to expiration, we may lose a little bit money due to time, but the closer we are to expiration, the more time will hurt us. So I'm going to go out to that option that's a little bit further out in time and purchase the 136 options. Now, with that, will you spend a little bit more money for that time? Yes, yes we will. If we buy an option, I'm going to change our layout here to show our delta and open interest. There we are. If we buy an option that is at the money, we are buying one that is closest to the current price of the stock. That's pretty typical to buy one the closest to, to the current price. We're going to be buying the 120 strike call option. 
Uh, so right here, it's going to cost us $3.20 on the ask. We'll have a 0.54 delta, rounded up to 0.55 delta. So that's right in line with the rules, which suggest our checklist, buy between a 40 and 60 delta. And we're right there, buying that 54 delta. Now, if you were to buy one that goes out 136 days, you'll spend $3.90 versus $3.20. So for another 35 days worth of time, we'll spend another 70 cents for an additional month worth of time. That's worth it, okay? And we have at least 200 contracts open interest. Um, here would be a deal breaker for me. If we had low open interest on the 120 options, 136 days out but we had plenty of open interest on the ones that had 101 days out. I would buy the ones that had 101 days out, okay? I would never go below 90 days, even though these may have more interest, which they don't, but I would never go, these do, but I would never go 45 days because 45 days from now, where could the stock be? It could still be right in here. And 45 days from now, if we haven't achieved our target, time decay or theta, has hurt our position drastically. So I would never buy anything under 90 days unless I were day trading it. But I would buy these 101 days if the open interest on the 136 days was not suitable interest or if the spreads were too wide, etc. So how do we analyze this trade? Well, check this out. I showed you when we went to risk graphs a little bit in the previous section, but if we want to buy these, it, they, they typically make it pretty simple. If you're a buyer, you're clicking on the ask price. If you're a seller of the option, you're clicking on the bid price. So since we're a buyer, we'll click on the ask. And notice it established a single buy, one contract of the $120 call expiring in April 2018, April 20th to be exact, and at a $3.90 cost basis per share. This is all per share. Now, uh, if you had clicked on the sells on the bid side, it would have set up a sell order. Okay, but we don't want to sell this. We want to buy this because we expect the stock to go up. Now, how do we anticipate our risk in the trade? Well, remember, if the stock price goes down, we're going to lose money relative to our 54 delta. If the stock goes up, we're going to make money relative to our 54 delta. And remember, that delta is not a static number. Gamma the gamma on our option will actually cause the delta to get higher or lower depending upon if the stock is moving in our favor or against us. So as the stock is moving in our favor, which is up in this case, our delta will grow. It'll get bigger. So we'll be more sensitive to the stock price moving. If the stock price is going against us, we're going to have a smaller delta. And yes, we'll be losing money, but we'll be losing money at a decreasing rate of speed if the stock is moving up, we'll be making money at an increasing rate of speed. Now, a really cool feature of this platform and any options trading platform I would suggest you using is going to have a way to analyze the risk profile. So we can see the risk profile here by just dragging this. We can see that we have unlimited profit potential no matter how high the stock price goes. Remember, x-axis, stock price y-axis on the left, profit or loss on our option position. So no matter what, at expiration, notice the graph, the legend down here where my cursor is, we can't lose more than how much money? 390 bucks a contract. But we're not going to lose 390 bucks a contract. We're not going to expect that because we're going to have a stop loss below 118.99. So here's where these price slices come in incredibly handy. So you might have to expand this where it says price slices, expand this, and it has three numbers by default already plugged in. These are stock price numbers. The default is current price, uh, 120.29. If the stock were to go 10% higher to 132.32 or 10% lower to 108.26, you would have a theoretical profit and loss for the day or since you open the position of these dollar amounts. But we're not going to be using 10% higher or lower. We're going to be using our entry, our stop, and our target. 
So we need to customize these fields here, these three fields. We'll leave the entry where it's at, but our stop loss is going where? Just below 118.99. So if I double click in this area and go 118.79, that's 20 cents below. 20 cents below our lower line in our fair value level. Now, if we go up to our profit target, our profit target is 125.46. I'm going to go up here and type in 125.46, enter. And notice it locks those two in place. Here's the lock, locks them in place. Now, what this will tell us is what our current delta is now what our delta would be if we got stapped out we can see that it got smaller what our delta would be if we reached our target we can see that that number got bigger as it should have right it does get bigger we get more dynamic leverage if we're right and the stock goes up we can see exactly how much per contract we're losing per day exactly how much per contract we're losing per day so 10 days from now if this stock has gone nowhere we will have lost $14.22 roughly for the whole trade if the stock goes nowhere if volatility moves in our favor we will make twenty nine dollars per one percentage point if volatility moves against us by one percentage point we will lose twenty nine dollars per percentage point which is why it's so important that we only buy these options when volatility is in the lower twenty percent this way, we'd expect that if volatility is going to go anywhere, it would go up and we would make that money. Okay. So if the stock price goes up, that's a positive to us. As time is going by, that's a negative to us. As volatility or if volatility goes up, that's a positive to us. And this will detail out our expected P&L for this particular trade if we get to our profit target today or to our stop loss today. And here we have about $85 worth of risk, not $390, $85 worth of risk at our stop loss and $333 at our profit target. Now, what's cool about this is that this tells us that we have around a four to one reward to risk ratio, but this is based on today's date, okay? So we need to consider that this may take several weeks. Today's December 5th. This may take one, two, this may take three weeks. This We may go on until just after Christmas, okay, uh, holiday. And so if we push this forward and say, what if we're still in this trade on the 27th of the month, 27th, right? It's 20, you know, 22 days from now. Well, then our risk reward profile changes. Why does it change? Why do we now lose more money? Why do we now make less money? Remember, as time goes by, what's happening every day? We are losing money due to that theta. So our profits will be smaller over time. Our losses will be larger over time. And so when you consider time decay as a factor, First of all, should we consider time decay as a factor in our risk, yes or no? Always consider time decay if it's working against you as a factor in our risk. And this is how we're going to base our position sizing. We're going to say if we're still in this trade three weeks from now, something's wrong. We shouldn't really be in this trade three weeks from now. This stock should make it back up to its target pretty quickly, or we should have been stopped out pretty quickly. If we're in this trade for several weeks and nothing's really going on, we're going to reconsider whether or not this is the right place for our money or not. But if we get stopped out three weeks from now, we got to know that we stand to risk upwards of 100 to maybe even 120 bucks almost. Okay. And then if we hit our profit target, you know, three weeks from now, we're not going to make the full $333. We're going to make closer to. $300. So this would explain for some of you guys that may have traded options in the past why your expected P&L uh, is different from your actual profit and loss uh, you know, down the road when you finally get out of this position. So this analyzer here will help us determine 
couple things. Number one, is the risk reward still worth it? Yes or no? We're still getting about a three to one reward to risk. So that's good. Reward versus risk. And uh, this tells us how much we can really, whether or not we can afford this trade or not. So if you can afford to lose $300 in a trade, sure, you can make this trade. You can buy multiple contracts. If your account size is limited, it's small, smaller at this point, and you can only afford to lose $50 in a trade, well, these are the parameters of the trade. This is the outcome of the trade based on all the right parameters that we have built. So therefore, if you can't risk $116 in, a, in this particular trade, you simply can't make this trade. There's no that you should not be manipulating any of the parameters of the stock. You should not be manipulating anything. We built this trade out objectively, looking at first the stock, our directional bias on the stock itself. We looked at implied volatility. We built the right trade. This particular trade would cost us $116 worth of risk. If we simply can't afford the risk, there's no making adjustments to the trade. We just simply can't do it. Okay. Uh, we can't make this trade. Move on, find a different trade. So often I found that uh, traders don't like what they see on the P&L or they're like, oh, that's too much risk. I'm going to move my stop loss or oh, that's not enough reward. I'm going to move my profit target. Okay, Everything is anchored off of the underlying entry, stop loss, and target. Everything is anchored off that. You don't change this information once you've objectively identified your entry, stop, and target. Once you've objectively built the option trade, you don't change the option trade. Nothing is going to change about that. Okay, So you just simply can't make the trade if you can't afford the risk. If you can't afford the risk, you go on and place the trade. Okay, And we're going to place this trade using a limit order, which would uh, allow us to buy this option at a price that we were comfortable buying it at. Okay. And so if we send this order over to the order bar, okay, we can actually start to set up orders. Okay, so check it out. Down below, I'm using the order bar now. Let's say we want to buy two contracts. I just increase it by two, which makes our risk what? On two contracts, our risk is 230 bucks. Our profit potential is 610. Notice if I change the multiples here, in the analyze, it changes your factors over here. It changes your P&L. So if we can afford 230 bucks worth of risk, we'll buy two contracts. Now, do we want to pay 390? Yeah. If the mid price is 385, as it says down here, let's go in between and try to pay 385. Okay. Now this is just a single order. This single order will actually. Uh, only send the order to enter the position. This will not allow us to get out of the position. Uh, we'd have to set that order up second. If, however, you want to set this trade up now and completely walk away, what do you do? You take a more advanced approach. And you go through and you set up in this platform what is known as a first triggers a sequence of orders. First triggers sequence. Okay. Now, what that allows us to do is come down to this order which we've already set up which is our entry order to buy right click right click on a lot of properties in your trading platforms and you'll find a lot of really neat factors and features create opposite order so if the entry order is buy the exit order is to sell those two contracts we're going to make these orders good till canceled that's what GTC stands for we should already know that from a previous web series and we're going to come over here and we're going to place a contingency on it. And, uh, you know, and we're going to say, hey, if you know, submit when at least one of the following conditions is met, if GLD is ever at or below mark or trades at or below 118.79 or if GLD is ever at or above 125.79. Here it is, 46, enter. Then I want you to sell these two option contracts at the market price, whatever they're worth. Okay, there's so many different rules and, and activation 
you know, characteristics and conditions and contingencies you could place out there to exit this position. But the simplest, what we're going to focus on today right now is enter if we can buy the option for 385. And once we own the option, it'll automatically send this next order in the sequence to work. And it will, is designed, we've just built it to sell those two contracts at the market price, good until canceled, if GLD, the stock itself, is ever at or below our stop loss or at or above our profit target. If any one of these two factors or price points are met, save it. It will sell our two options and we'll be out of the trade and we can take a completely hands-off approach at this point. That is how to go through building an option trade on a stock that you've already identified as a long stock candidate. Okay. Uh, if you have any questions about how any of this works, Okay, the rules, criteria. Uh, I can't guarantee that I will know what platform you're working on and how to set up the orders in your platform. That may be more of a question for your brokerage uh, house. Um, but if you have any questions about the rules, the guidelines, uh, you miss, you think you misinterpreted or misunderstood something, or I didn't explain something clear enough, or you want to hear it a different way, just send us an email. Ask us, support at tradersarmy.com, and we'll be happy to help in every way that we can. Thanks for joining us on this web series on long stock and buying long call positions. We hope you enjoyed it, and we'll see you in the next one. Take care.